Amber, I see that green on you looking beautiful. Thank you so much. Love you, both you? of you. Hey, happy Hispanic Heritage Month to both of you. And congratulations to both of you on your new show. I just want you to know that I do get your name right because my sister's name is Jalisa too. So I never, I never get that wrong. <laughs> but I've been inspired by you, you know, since I was a teenager watching you grow into the successful woman. I um, mean, you too, uh, Chef Brent. I just want to say thank you for sharing your delicious recipes with the world. And, you know, just staying thank true you. to uh, your Afro-Latina background. In light of Halloween approaching, can you both share a horror story with us of a time when you were filming for this show or any show or just you being in the kitchen and things just weren't going your way? It was headed towards disaster. Um, <laughs> if that's ever happened to you, what happened? And also, how did you bounce back from that to keep the ball rolling? I have one off the top of my head. I was on my cookbook tour and I was in Atlanta on Fox 5. And um, they didn't check to see if the stove was on. So here's one thing that people don't know, talking about misconceptions earlier that Jaleesa uh, addressed, people don't see the behind the scenes of TV and they specifically don't see the behind the scenes of food. Food TV is very nuanced and very, it, it, it's, a, it's a completely different pacing, a completely different scenario than other kinds of genres. Um, there's just a, there are a lot of moving parts. Food has to get cooked. You have to buy the right ingredients. You have to have a working range. You have to have running water. Things that you might take for granted, but actually need to happen in food production. So yeah, and live TV is a whole other thing, right? So like when you're on live TV and cooking, you have four minutes to get your demo out, your talking points, and there is no room for error, really. So yeah, I was on a, um, a morning live segment and it's not my responsibility to check if the gas is working. I assume that when I get to the studio, the gas, the gas or the electric range is working. And sure enough, it was not. And we had this huge spread out, my team and I. And again, live TV in front of, I think the Atlanta audience has about 5 million viewers and no gas. So there was no, nothing at all. So I just, fortunately, we have a thing called beauty. And so that means that it's a plate that's already finished that I've already done behind the scenes before we went live. And so I had a beauty to show, but I just winged it. I had my host who was amazing. The host does definitely make a difference in a situation like that. Cause she'll just kind of help you fill in the gaps and just be, you know, funny about it. Comedy always saves people. Comedy will always get you out of a tricky situation. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but can I ask you, I'm so yeah. curious, how many times do you have to make the dish so how many um, variations, like how, how many times do you actually have to cook the dish? Because as you said, it's four minutes. And even now when you're cooking in front of us, you're like, this yeah. is what the product looks like. I've always wondered in food segments, how many times you have to actually make the dish that you're talking about on live TV or on TV? Right. So that's a really great question. I appreciate that because again, there's just so much that people don't see behind the scenes. You just see this beautiful dish that comes out hot and steaming. Um, your production company has a large role and plays a large role in how easy and seamless things happen. When I was filming the show, there were a couple of bumps here and there, and that, those are just things that are out of everybody's control, right? But normally, if you have a, um, a streamlined process and you understand how food production works, you can generally get it in one or two tries. There are opportunities or there are moments where the dish is way elaborate. There are a lot of steps and I can't do it in real time. So we'll make it in the kitchen. Um, it'll be in the oven or some, you know, my culinary team will be making it. And then I start the process and then voila, food magic or TV magic. I have the beautiful dish, but there aren't, there isn't a lot of error where we actually have to swipe and wipe everything and start from the beginning. If that happens, something has gone wrong on all levels. And we really try to avoid that. But again, a solid production team and obviously good talent can can mitigate that. But that's a really great question. Yeah, because obviously we always see the finished product, but we can't sit there and wait for the beef roast for that's 45 minutes. Yeah. So I'm curious, like and, and, how many beef yeah. roasts you make? You know no, but I, I, I will say, no, 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 I will say, so we, in the show, in Culture Kitchen, we were very authentic. We did a lot of the recipes in the, most of the shows, all 16 in real time. So a lot of time we would actually wait for the steam to come up so that we're cooking in real time and I'm tasting the actual food that I actually prepared on set. So, you know, when you and I were talking yesterday, you asked a good question about, you know, things that we do behind the scenes. 
we never used any substitutes. A lot of times in like food commercials, you'll see like glue for milk or you'll see, um, there's just a whole bunch of substitutes for like food styling, but on the show, everything was real. Everything was purchased that morning. Everything was fresh and ready to cook that anybody they wanted to eat it, they could. But because we're in COVID, there were a few restrictions with actually eating all the food that I prepared. But trust and believe, when my culinary producer, Francesca, photographed it, your girl was in the dressing room eating everything I had just cooked. <laughs> so Lisa, what was your horror story? Oh, okay. Well, this one can be really quick. Um, so right behind me, you guys see the jar. This is actually the um, shipper box. This is the box when you order that it comes in. It's pretty snug because I, I don't believe in being wasteful. So this is um, corrugated recycles. So right here, you will see, I'm gonna peel it off in front of you if I can because it's pretty stuck on there. So the biggest horror story in launching Republica was that I got these boxes made. As you can see, there's a label covering the box design that was made. Because if you look really, really closely, let me know when you see it. It in fact does not say Republica. They forgot the B. So it says Republica. What is Republica? I have no idea. So that, my friends, when you're an entrepreneur and you've ordered 10,000 boxes, Oh God, yeah. <laughs> so you have to think back as an entrepreneur and how are you gonna cover the mistake? Well, for me, it was creating labels that go right over it. Wow. So that was the biggest horror story because it's just invoice after invoice when you're an entrepreneur and when you've already paid and spent so much time on designing this <laughs> and it goes wrong. And at the end of the day, you can't, no one gets blamed except you because you are the founder, the CEO, the, the main person wearing all the hats. You have to come up with a solution. So that was the biggest horror story for me. I literally got the phone call and I, yeah, my intestines basically fell out of my body. <laughs>